What's up, y'all? This is DJ Kenny Parker, DJ and producer of Boogie Down Productions slash KRS-One. And today I'm going to do a story about the number one question that people have been asking me over the years to explain, and I'm going to get into it today. The question is, what happened between KRS-One and PM Dawn? What's the real story behind that? And the answer is, there's a lot that happened behind that. You know, over the years, I've seen people talk about their experiences. They were there, what they heard. And most of it, to me, is a lot of misinformation. Some people have an accurate description of what's going on, but a lot of it is just people made up stuff, and they got bits and pieces of it, but they didn't really know what was going on. So today, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Once and for all, this is it. I was there for the planning of the incident. I was an active participant in the incident, and I was there for the whole aftermath. I had a firsthand account of everything that happened. So I figure I'm probably as best qualified to answer this question of anybody outside of Karis One. Okay, let's go. First, let me give you a little backstory. It was about 1991, late 91, I would say like December when this whole incident occurred. Around this time, BDP had like some little beefs brewing with some other groups in hip hop. Around this time, Chris had changed his philosophy from the BDP stance that people had known previously. And Chris started moving more into a humanist approach where before he talked mostly about the problems of the black man in America, which he still did. But he started leaning more towards saying that we are all human beings, white, black, Asian, and the problems in America are bigger than racism. And we need to approach it from a human perspective, not just black against white, white against Asian, Asian against black. He was moving more in that direction. I'm paraphrasing, but there. So some of the other pro-black groups in hip hop didn't really appreciate Chris's new stance. So one of the groups that stepped up and had a little subliminal things to say was the group called X-Clan. It's been documented, you know, X-Clan took some shots and they weren't happy with Chris's new approach. Okay, so we heard the shots and we took note of it. And we said, okay, we'll answer this later on. Then we got into a little spat with poor righteous teachers around this time. It was minor, but it, it ended up being a little bit more than that. It was like a little confrontation with poor righteous teachers. This was all happening around this same time. And around this time, Ice Cube had said a certain statement on his America's Most Wanted album, which he said, some rappers are heaven sent, but self-destruction don't pay the fucking rent. Chris heard this line and was not happy at all. Ice Cube was saying that, in his defense, he was saying that Chris took the line out of perspective of what he meant, and he meant something different by the line. I don't know exactly what he meant. That'd be something Ice Cube would have to explain, but at the time, we took it as a disrespect, considering self-destruction was Chris's pet project. If anybody remembers that song, Chris is the one who helped organize all the rappers on that song. D-Nice of BDP produced the song. KRS-One is on the song. Miss Melody is on the song. D-Nice is on the song. And Just Ice is on the song, which is a longtime KRS-One friend dating back to the shelter and a BDP affiliate and a dope MC. So... That was basically a BDP song featuring other artists. So Ice Cube came out and he did self-destruction. All right, so all this was happening around the same time. So Chris was starting to get annoyed. And I think that's what led to the direction of the Sex and Violence album that we were working on. That was a theme album, which was more like, let's take it back a little bit to the roots of BDP because some people are getting it twisted like we're going in another direction, which we, we there's a couple of directions that we can go in. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Chris has an interview with a magazine called Details and he sits down to do the interview and the, the uh, interviewer asked him, so how do you feel about Prince B of PM Dawn dissing you? 
So Chris was like, what are you talking about? So the interviewer said, yeah, he dissed a few guys. He dissed NWA. He said, public enemy is making mountains out of molehills. And he said, Karis one wants to be a teacher. A teacher of what? So Chris was like, what? Now we got this dude dissing me? Okay, this is too much. Now, the reason I'm bringing up this story once again is because a lot of people asked me to, to bring clarity to what happened. And in defense of Prince B of PM Dawn, who passed away in 2016, he is not around to defend himself, unfortunately. Um, but I'm going to tell my recollection of events anyway, and you people could decide what happened. This is my recollection, recollection of events, and um, no disrespect to Prince B., um, rest in peace. Okay. So, all of this is happening at the end of 1991. Now, me, I'm a person around this time who used to hang out all the time. I was in every party in New York City. If there was a party, I was there. So, I went to one party, and back in this time, when you went to a party, there would be people outside giving out flyers for the next party, which was perfect. There was no internet or social media. So it was kind of hard to find out where the next party was. So people would be in front of the party giving out flyers. Somebody gave me a flyer to the MTV party, birthday party for T Money of MTV, who's one of the hosts of Your MTV Raps. And it was at the Sound Factory Club. And on the bill was... Leaders of the New School, Black Sheep, Nice and Smooth, Supercat Reggae Artist, and PM Dawn. So I saw this. I said, oh, PM Dawn is performing. I went right to the studio. I said, yo, Chris, check out this flyer. Chris is Karis One, for those of you that don't know. Uh, from this point on, I'm going to call him Chris, but it's Karis One. I said, Chris, check out this flyer. PM Dawn is performing at this sound factory. So Chris was like, yo, I'm going to go to the sound factory and I'm going to battle him. I'm going to battle him right there on stage. I'm going to challenge him to a battle. I'm going to show him who the teacher is. So we were like, okay, Chris, let's do it. And I remember in the studio at that time, Freddie Fox was there. The MC Freddie Fox, shout to you, Fox. He said he was coming as well, although he didn't make it that night, but he said at the time he was coming. So say this was, say, say the Sound Factory party was on like a Friday. This was like Tuesday night. We were in the studio. So we said, okay, we're going to go to the club. Fast forward to Friday night. We all meet up at the studio and we head over to the sound factory. Present was me, Karis One, a guy named Willie D. Not to be confused with Willie D of the Ghetto Boys. This was a guy named Will who was a member of BDP from the beginning. And he was also the president of Chapter 5 of the Zulu Nation. And Will is a very important part of this story, and that's why I bring him up. Willie D was with us, and uh, unfortunately, Willie D passed away in 2020. Rest in peace, my dude. But um, I know he would want me to tell this story because he talked about it so many times afterwards, and he was very proud of the incident. So I'm going to tell Willie D's part here. Okay, so it's me, Karis One, Willie D., I see you. We all know him from the record. My brother's name is Kenny. That's Kenny Parker. My other brother, I see you, is much darker. I see you. Just Ice was there. That's five. A guy named Jigsaw, who was a friend of Willie D's, a real tough street dude from the Bronx. I'm just going to leave it right there. <laughs> That's six. And a group called Real Live. 
it was a two guys. One was named K Def and one was named Larry O. Later on, they would come out with a record called Real Live Shit in 96. I'm sure most of you remember this song, but this was way before they had actually even had a record deal. They used to do shows with us and was working with us uh, getting their demo together. So they was with us. I'm not sure if both of them was there. I'm pretty sure K Def was there. I don't remember if Larry O was there for sure. He could have been, but I'm pretty sure K Def was there. So that's about seven guys. We get to the place. We were going to meet Freddie Fox, but he didn't show up. So we went inside. We sat right next to the stage. I remember we were right there next to the stage. The stage was right there. And Karis One had on a hoodie over his head. So most people couldn't even see who he was. But I was sitting there. You know, most people know when Karis One comes to a party, he's usually there to get on the microphone and rock. Chris was known back in those days for just doing impromptu performances at clubs in New York. But this time, he was just chilling in the cut, so it was kind of odd. Okay. We're there. We're chilling. By another 15, 20 minutes, we see Kid Capri. Shout out to DJ Kid Capri. Chris, what you doing here? This guy, PM Dawn, dissed me in the magazine. I'm going to step to him when it's showtime. Kid Capri is like, ah, so he's there now. Then we see Naughty by Nature. Bunch of them. Led by Tretch. Shout out to Tretch. Now, I'm not saying Tretch had anything to do with this incident at all. I'm just saying we saw Tretch and he was deep as they always were back in the day. He had to be like 20 deep. Shout out to all them dudes. The 118th Street Posse, I think they're called. Shout out to them. Tretch was deep. And when Chris said, yo, this dude PM Dawn dissed me in a magazine, I'm going to step to him. Tresh's face lit up. Tresh's fam. So, you know, he's like, what? Okay. I'm not saying Tresh had anything to do with the incident. I'm just saying he was there. And if anybody knew, knows Tresh, you know that a young Tresh was all about the smoke. He wanted all smoke all the time. Shout out to Tresh. Okay. So now in this little area where we were, it got kind of crowded. It got kind of thick. It started out with just us seven, and now there's probably 20-something dudes over in this corner. So I don't know who performed first, but somebody performed first. It might have been leaders of the new school. A couple of, a couple of artists performed first, and then it was time for Prince B. Now, my job was to get control of the turntables by any means necessary. I had a guy with me, Jigsaw. He was assigned to me. Me and Jigsaw went to the DJ booth to get control of the DJ booth so I can be ready when Chris hit the stage. The DJ booth was up one level, so it was probably like on the second floor. And from the DJ booth, you can see the whole party. You can look down and see everything. Who was DJing that night? DJ Clark Kent. Shout out to Clark Kent, my dude. I see Clark Kent. He's up there, and it's in between acts. So somebody might have been on stage at that moment. So I go up to Clark, who I had just met. I, I didn't even really know Clark Kent at this point. I might have met him once. We had mutual friends. I might have just met him. Okay. I say, yo, Clark, I need, I need to borrow the turntables for a second. And he looks at me like, come on, man, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking here. Like, you know, you know, it, it's kind of disrespectful for a, a DJ to be up there rocking a club and another DJ walks up and says, let me get on. You know, he's up there doing his job. So he kind of looks at me like, yo, like I'm rocking up here. You know what you mean? So I said, no, Clark, look, Karis One's about to do something special up there and I got to be ready. So Clark... Thankfully, was like, all right, here, take the turntables, but I'm going to play some music. He had a reel-to-reel tape recorder. And on this reel-to-reel, he had some unreleased DOS Effect songs on there. So he hits the, the reel-to-reel while I'm setting up the turntable. He hits the reel-to-reel, and he's playing some unreleased DOS Effect songs that actually never, never made it to the album. So everybody was hearing some exclusive DOS Effects. And it was dope. Okay. 
So now my job was this. When Chris comes on stage and gets the microphone, I was supposed to throw on three songs. One was the classic record, The Bridge is Over. And this right here is the instrumental album. Hope you can see it if I'm moving it right to The Bridge is Over instrumental album. And um, this right here is actually the test pressing of the instrumental album. Let me see if I could turn it properly. Uh, it's kind of hard to see with the glare. Okay, you can't really see it. It's kind of beat up. But this is the test pressing of the record. Kind of exclusive. I just had to flex right there. Okay. Also, I was to throw on the new single, Duck Down. This is Duck Down right here. It was not out in stores yet. It was still a uh, test press. And this was the record I was supposed to throw on. But the very first record I was supposed to throw on when Chris hit that stage was a record called I'm Still Number One. Classic BDP record off of the By Any Means Necessary album. Now this right here is the white label test press. That's the other side. This is the, this is the test press promo of I'm Still Number One. This particular record is 20, 35 years old, maybe? 30-something years old? Had to flex right there. Had the white label. Just had to do that to y'all real quick. Okay. Oh, wait. Unfortunately for me, Still Number One didn't have an instrumental. This only has Still Number One, the extended remix, and Jack of Spades. What is on the back of this? Jack of Spades. So... What we had was something called an acetate. An acetate is a, a special record that you make. It's super thick. Look, if you can see the thickness of an actual 12-inch record, it's the same size, except it's twice as thick as this. I'm not holding it right. It's twice as thick, so it's kind of hard to move and control. You could only play it like 30 times, and then the grooves will wear out. It's like a temporary record for you to listen to. And we had that instrumental because BDP only rocks instrumentals. We don't lip sync over vocals. So I had the acetate, which was the first thing I had to cue up. But the problem with the acetate is hard to cue up. So I'm sitting there trying to get it cued. And I'm, I'm watching the stage and I'm waiting like, you know, for my cue. So now all of a sudden, PM Dawn hits the stage. Prince B and his brother was the DJ. I think his name is Minute Mix, was the DJ. And they had some girl dancers, and they hit the stage. Boom. And nothing happens. PM Dawn is performing, and there's nothing. So now I'm like, oh, man, Chris lost his nerve. He's not going to do it. They get to the song, set adrift on memory bliss of you which had been number one. At that time, it might have been the number one song in America at that time. Late uh, 1991, this was the number one song in America. So he comes up to do his song. There's about a thousand people in this party. It's packed. Everybody was there. He's doing his song. People are nodding. And then all of a sudden, there was a ramp going up to the stage. And I can see figures coming up the ramp while Prince B is performing. So I, and I recognize one of them as being the very tall Karis One. So I said, uh-oh, it's on. Quick backtrack. I forgot to mention this. Right before we went into the club, Willie D turns to Chris and says, yo, Chris, whatever happens, make sure you bail me out, man. Make sure you bail me out. And we all started laughing like, yo, Will is bugging. OK, I keep that in mind. At the time when he said it, we all laughed. OK, Chris is coming up the ramp. Prince B is performing to the crowd. Sad adrift on memory bliss with you. 
And then Chris walks right up to Prince B and grabs the microphone. Now, right as Prince, right as Chris is grabbing the microphone from Prince B, Willie D goes to the DJ who's on stage, takes the record off the turntable and smashes it. Bang! Now, the music wasn't coming from the DJ. It was actually coming from the side, a DAT tape on the side of the, uh, where the sound man was. So the sound man was playing the music. So when Will smashed the record, it didn't stop the music. There were some girl dancers that were dancing at the time. I don't know who it was, but somebody pushed all of these girls off to the side. One of them like fell on the floor. And I didn't actually see that, but I know it's the fact because later on, one of these girls tried to sue KRS-One. Don't know what happened with the lawsuit, but it was a real lawsuit and somebody pushed this girl on the ground. Boom. So now when Chris grabs the mic from Prince B, he turns. Keep in mind, he was in the middle of his song. The music's still playing. He turns and, he, and he's pulling the mic from Chris and Chris takes his hand and kind of pushes Chris B and takes the microphone from him. Now, Chris has the mic. Right at this moment, the sound man cuts off the music because it's like, what's going on? So the music stops. Chris is there. He's looking at Prince B. Willie D comes from whatever damage he was doing in the back and comes right up to Prince B and punches him right in his face. Pow! Boom! Oh! I'm watching this from my vantage point one story up. I'm like, oh, he just hit him. Will catches him again. Pow! Now, Prince B is a big guy. He had to be about 6'3", and probably like 350 pounds. So Will catches him twice. Oh, and then somebody, I'm not sure it was either ICU or Just Ice or both of them, Push PM Dawn, Prince B, off the stage, drops into the crowd. Bang. So now the crowd, it's a thousand people in this place. They start to back up. Everybody backs up because it looked like a it looked like a robbery. Chris takes the mic and goes, BDP in the motherfucking house. And everybody said, Oh. When Chris says BDP in the motherfucking house, I'm like, well, that's my cue. And I drop, I'm still number one. And all of you know how the horns go, and I'm still number one. Then the beat drops. Boom! When that beat dropped, the place went bananas. I have done over a thousand shows with KRS One, well over a thousand. I've probably been to hundreds of concerts with other groups. I have never in my life seen a crowd so wild and go so crazy as when KRS One grabs the mic and I threw on, I'm still number one. That place was rocking right next to me was Clark Kent. He turns to me and said, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Just like that. So I'm half laughing, but I'm still working. So my next mission, Chris is not even rhyming. He's just go, go, go. And the crowd is jumping to the ceiling. My next mission is to grab the bridges over. So I'm queuing up the bridges over. So the time for me to take me to go down to my record bag, pull out the bridges over, and put it on the turntable, I look over, and Clark Kent was gone. I saw him down on the floor running to the stage. By this point, the stage is packed. Jump, jump. People on the stage jumping. People on the ground jumping. T-Money, whose birthday party it was, 
he was on the stage going crazy. Queen Latifah was on the stage going crazy. Naughty was up there. Everybody was just jumping, jumping. So now I throw on the bridge is over. All people start screaming again. And Chris is going, the dawn is over, the dawn is over. But bye bye, the dawn is over, the dawn is over. Man, I'm not even describing to you people properly how savage it was in this place. Right as this is happening, I could see from the corner of my eye, security comes running in to the club. A pack of them come running, and I can see Prince B. He's now down on the floor where everybody else is, and he looks a little, uh, looks a little dazed and confused like he doesn't know what happened, which he shouldn't. One minute he was performing, next minute he gets punched in his face and thrown off the stage. So now security comes running in from the side, and they look and see Karis one and they all just stop. And it was just a party. I saw all of them just collectively just stop. There's nothing you could do. The whole place is rocking. It's a party. So now Chris is there saying he's just talking shit. Anybody that wanted with BDP, what? Anybody that wanted. Anybody that wanted with BDP, what? Like that. So now I'm digging up the third and final record, which was Duck Down, the new single. As I throw on Duck Down... Chris starts to leave the stage and the mob starts to follow him off the stage. Everybody's off. It was so wild and pandemonium in there that a fight, the people in the crowd started fighting amongst themselves. It just turned into like a riot. There was a little fight over here, a little fight over there. I'm looking at this from down like, yo, this is off the walls. We had no idea it was going to turn into this, but this was crazy. They just, they were so wild, they just turned on each other. So now, I'm by myself now. The guy Jigsaw that was with me, he was gone. Everybody was gone. The last part of the plan, nothing went according to plan, but the last part of the plan was Chris's wife, then girlfriend, had the car and she was supposed to be outside in front of the club. At that time, Chris was driving a red BMW. She was supposed to be outside in front of the club. When we came out the club, she was going to be there in the car. We jumped in the car and we sped off. Of course, everything was so chaotic that that didn't happen either. I walked through the club. Everything was wild. I get outside. I don't see anybody. I see Chris's girlfriend, she's in the BM, and she's screaming at me, where's Chris? Where's Chris? I'm like, I don't know, he's supposed to be with you. She's like, you got to go back in there. You got to go back in there and get him. I'm like, I can't go back in there, it's pandemonium in there. She's like, you got to go back in there, you got to go back in there. I'm like, oh Lord. So now I'm by myself go back into the sound factory, and surprisingly, security lets me back in the club. I go in the club. I don't see Chris anywhere. There's no more performance. I think Supercat never even got to perform that night. It was over. The party was over. I didn't see Chris, so I went back outside, jumped in the car with Chris's girlfriend, and we drove to the rendezvous point, which was Chris's old apartment in lower Manhattan. When we get there, Chris is outside with Just Ice, and they're laughing. They're in front of the building just talking. We pull up. Just Ice takes off. Chris jumps in the car, and we head to New Jersey. Chris had just bought a house in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey, And we were heading there for the night. We get to Chris's house. His wife goes off to upstairs to the rooms and it's just me and Chris in the house. So we're like, yo, can you believe what just happened? No, neither one of us can believe it. Afterward, 
we talked for a little while, and then we went to sleep. The next morning, we wake up. Chris has dozens of messages on his machine. Jive Records was calling every 10 minutes. You got to come to Jive. You got to come to Jive. We got to do a press conference. Everyone's talking about this. We got to find out what happened. So we get dressed. Me and Chris, we went to Jive Records. We get to Jive Records, we come inside, and everybody's just looking at us like, yo. Who was there? Buster Rhymes was in there in Jive. I guess he was there with Q-Tip. This is when Scenario was out. Buster sees Chris, and keep in mind, he was there the night before because Leaders of the New School was on the bill. Buster sees Chris and he goes, yo, that was incredible. And he grabs Chris and he just starts shaking him. Ah, and he's just shaking Chris so hard that they knocked over a computer that was on somebody's desk onto the ground. Bang. Remember those big white computers that used to sit on people's desks? I don't know if it was IBM or something. It was on big old school computers. Buster knocked one of those over onto the ground. Bang. Broke it. Broke it. It's like, wow, Buster was super excited. So I was like, okay, we go into this conference room. In the conference room was all news, daily news, every rap magazine, MTV, Billboard, BET, every hip-hop journalist and music journalist that you could think of was in this room. We sit down, me and Chris, and then they ask him, what happened? Why did you do this? And here's where the problem starts. Chris told the truth. He said, PM Dawn dissed me in the magazine, so I stepped to him and showed him who the real teacher was. And when he said that, the backlash was immediate and vicious. Chris was better off saying, yo, man, I was drunk. I don't know what happened. I just got up there. I was drunk. I don't even remember. And I just did it. He was better off saying that than he was saying, Prince B dissed me. So this is what happened. Because then from that point on, everybody started saying, Karis One is a hypocrite. He's supposed to be Mr. Stop the Violence, and he goes and does this to another rapper. How can this be? Now, Mr. Stop the Violence is a, is a, is a funny nickname to me, and it's actually derogatory. It comes from this album right here, By All Means Necessary. And it's one of the songs, one of the singles, I think it was the third single from the, uh, no, it was the second single from the album. It's funny to me how of all the songs that Chris did, and this up to that point, this is 1991, that people would pick Stop the Violence as the song for him to be Mr. Stop the Violence. I find that odd, but, you know, on this same album, was another song, the lead single and only video from this album. And at that time was probably one of Chris's top two or three songs in his catalog. And is still today one of the biggest songs of his career. It was called My Philosophy. And in this song, My Philosophy, Chris says, Karis One is just the guy to lead a crew right up to your face and diss you. Everyone who knows the song knows the line. Now, to me, if a guy who says Karis One is just the guy to lead a crew right up to your face and diss you actually leads a crew right up to somebody's face and disses them, to me, that's not a hypocrite. That's what he said in the song. But people didn't really pick that. They didn't call him Mr. My Philosophy. They called him Mr. Stop the Violence. And from that, 
he became a hypocrite and missed to stop the violence. So from that point on, the whole rest of the year really was dominated by the PM Dawn incident. First of all, MTV was furious. This was the MTV party. Prince B, PM Dawn, was probably the only group on that bill who had regular rotation on MTV. Leaders of the New School weren't on regular rotation. Nice and Smooth, I don't think at that time, was on regular rotation. But Set Adrift on Memory Bliss was the number one song in America. That was playing all day, every day on MTV. And this rapper comes on there and ruins their party. They were furious and they said BDP is banned from MTV. Period. Every interview that we did from that point on centered around PM Dawn. We dropped the new album, Sex and Violence, and Chris would be trying to talk about the album, and all people kept saying was, but what about the PM Dawn incident? And I know this because I used to be right next to him watching all the interviews. We even went to Japan to promote the album, and reporters were like, I didn't even understand the language. They were just like, dot, 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 PM Dawn, PM Dawn. I'm like, show. This is all people want to talk about. And for the press, it was overwhelmingly negative reviews from people who weren't there. Even some of the people who were there in the building later turned and said, Nah, I ain't have nothing to do with that. And Chris shouldn't have done that. Maybe he shouldn't have. But to me, that's hypocritical as well because I saw them. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, I think this incident had a, a negative effect on Chris's record sales. One of the reasons why I think Sex and Violence didn't do the numbers of the previous BDP albums was because of the negative backlash from that incident. I think overall in hip hop, the mood for, to me was like 70-30. 70% of the people was like, Chris shouldn't have done that, that was terrible. And 30% of the people was like, yeah. BDP stepped up for the streets. So anyone that tells you that this was an organized event, that's wrong. Anybody that tells you that they was there and Chris came into place with 30 dudes, that's wrong. We came into place with seven dudes. Anybody that tells you that Karis one punched Prince B in the face and threw him off the stage, that's wrong. It wasn't Karis one that did that. But Chris has to take responsibility because he's the leader of the crew and whatever happened that night, is because he was there, and as the leader of the group, he has to take responsibility for everything that happened. So that's the story in a nutshell. I was there the whole time, from beginning to end, and the year after, and that's how it happened. Eventually, things blew over. Karis One dropped the, ready, the return of the Boom Bap album and got back on track. MTV eventually played his music again. And um, we moved on. Uh, two funny things over the years in the aftermath of that story. One is that Prince B of PM Dawn knew exactly what happened because we went to do the Arsenio Hall show. And we had done the show before a few times. So around, right around that time after the incident, we went to the Arsenio Hall show. And at the Arsenio Hall show, they have this one wall where all the artists and guests who come to the place sign their name on this wall. So we went there. After we did our performance on Arsenio, we went to sign the wall again. And we saw our old tags up there. I saw my name, Chris. When it got to Willie D, there was a line with a marker through Willie D's name. And over it, it said, Prince B., PM Dawn over Willie D's name. <laughs> Yo, Will was so tight. We was dying laughing. Will was 
tight. Yo, I can't believe that sucker crossed my name out like that. Yo, Prince B knew exactly who hit him, and he dissed the will on that boy. And we was dying laughing. Two, when I lived in Jersey City, years after the incident, a couple of times, now PM Dawn is from Jersey City, and I lived in the same city that they were from. A couple of times, I had walked down the street, and I heard a car honking me, bam, bam, and I turned around, and there was Prince B riding in the Range Rover and rolled past me. This happened a couple times where he just said, you know, bam, bam, and kept it going. Now, to me, I guess it meant, you know, what's up? Let bygones be bygones. It's years later. Boom, boom. What's up, dude? What's up? No problem. It could have been that. Or it could have been, I see you. I could have caught you slipping and got you. <laughs> Here I am. Beep, beep. See me. And he rides past. It could have been that too. And he could have caught me slipping because I wasn't even thinking about him at this time. Anyway, that's the story. And um, thank you very much for sticking around this long. If you like the story, please give me a uh, thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. I have a bunch of stories coming. I was uh, courtside, ringside for a whole lot of events that I'm going to be talking about over the years. Also, the book is in stores now. You can get it on Amazon. My brother's name is Kenny, the greatest true hip-hop story ever told. It's the behind-the-scenes look at the creation of BDP, our struggles as children growing up in New York, how it all happened, more stories, my behind-the-scenes look. It's a must-read, I think. Get it. I'll put the description down below. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next time.